Hi there, welcome. Um, I guess we're live now from uh, my dining room. Uh, it's great to great to have all of you with us. My name is Daniel Rosenberg, and uh, I'm excited to be moderating tonight's panel, which promises to be a riveting one. I would like to start off by thanking the H team for putting this together and asking me to host, and to all of you for joining us here this evening. And thanks for taking an interest in Aisha's programming. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Aish, that they seek to examine and embrace the complexities of modern spirituality to help others live fuller lives and welcome all backgrounds and ideologies, helping to build a vibrant, active, supportive community that is representative of today's New York City. Well, hopefully not today's, but the previous and, um, and today's Judaism. Uh, I'd like to think I was asked to moderate tonight because Rabbi Jacobs and I were best friends in nursery school and he can't get enough of me. But I think the reason he honored me with this amazing panel of women is because of my background as a producer and writer of major, major motion pictures and television, uh, and now co-founder of Pyro, a production company and an ad agency based in New York. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do tonight. Um, the format for tonight is first some quick introductions of our panelists followed by 10 minute sessions of questions based on various subject matter related to unorthodox. I had nothing to do with the show. I did watch it, although it was a few weeks ago. So I did a quick uh, refresher by reading some synopses, but uh, please don't hold it against me if I am not a confirmed expert. Uh, the first subject we're gonna tackle tonight is generally how people receive the show. And we're gonna ask for our panelists opinion. The next 10 minutes, we're gonna talk about insularity in the Hasidic community sexism, fundamentalism, and then finally, the sequence in the show that focused on Berlin, we'll call the Berlin sequence. If that subject matter doesn't make any sense to you, it's possibly because you didn't watch the show. Um, at 9 p.m., there will be a half hour Q&A. So if you have any questions during the show, please email them ahead of time to info at aishnewyork.com. That's info at A-I-S-H-N-Y.com and the H crew are going to select the best ones and have me ask them. So yes, your questions will be judged. Speaking of judgment, our first panelist is Judge Rachel Fryer, who was elected as civil court judge in November of 2016 and is currently assigned to Kings County Criminal Court. Uh, she's recently honored as one of Brooklyn Law's trailblazers for being the first Hasidic woman to be elected to public office. Judge Fryer is a proud, devoted mother and grandmother and member of the Hasidic community. Please welcome Judge Fryer. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me on the program today. Super. It is great to have you. Um, next, we are welcoming Pearl Gluck, who is a, an American filmmaker and professor. Her films, which explore themes of class, gender, and faith, have appeared as part of the Sundance Lab as well as the Cannes Film Festival, Tribeca Film Festival, and on PBS. Pearl grew up in, Brook in Borough Park, Brooklyn, where she was raised in a Hasidic household. Though she remains close to her family, she elected to not continue their lifestyle. Please welcome Pearl Gluck. Hi, thanks for having uh, me. Thanks for being here, Pearl. Uh, Next up is Liz Lang, an American fashion designer and entrepreneur and founder of Liz Lang Maternity, which introduced form-fitting designer pregnancy wear in 1998. And uh, Liz has been described as a pioneer in the apparel industry. Please welcome Liz. And Liz. <laughs> All right. First technical difficulty of the evening. We've lost Liz. Okay, so we are going to introduce uh, our next guest, which is Rebison Liat Meyerfeld, who was one of the UK's most senior and sought after speakers. She has been brought to speak in seminars internationally in Spain, Poland, Israel, Denmark, the US and Australia. She is an academic who loves to learn and read and her wisdom and keen insight into people combined with her ability to distill deep ideas into tangible and relevant life lessons make her a superb. 
superb educator and member of the AISH staff and community here in New York. Please welcome Leah. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Happy to be here. Well, it is great to have you. I think what we'll do is we'll get started and hopefully Liz will join us shortly. Um, so just a reminder, we have a Q&A afterwards starting at 9. Info at hnewyork.com, hny.com if you want to email questions. Uh, and I do have a disclaimer, which is that while we're excited to have our esteemed panelists, their views are their own and do not necessarily represent the views of H New York, which means that you guys have to be on your best behavior. Um, so first question, uh, and we're already four minutes ahead of schedule, which is fantastic news. So, um, the first question is, how are people receiving unorthodox? Um, what kind of reactions have you seen? How do you guys experience, how did you experience the, the, um, the show? Uh, oh, we just got Liz back. So Liz, I don't know if you heard the question, but welcome. You got an amazing question. Okay. Sorry, but, my Wi-Fi is terrible at my house, to be honest. No, so it could happen again. No worries. Well, welcome. We're excited to have you. And we're going to give you the first question. I mean, what's what was your experience watching it? What have you heard about from others? Well, I didn't get to say, but as a very brief introduction, I am a... Um, I grew up as a very secular Jew, very, very reformed, basically, you know, Passover and the high holidays, and that was it. Um, so I watched this show, and my reaction was different than a lot of my uh, friends' reactions. I, I was somewhat angered and slightly offended by it, which is strange. It's not that I was offended by this woman's story. Um, I respect the story. It was more, I felt there was a certain glee um, in my community, in my reform community about recommending this show, loving this show, talking about this show, um, you know, almost a Tiger King moment. Um, <laughs> and I just, I guess I, I felt differently. I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't relish sort of the the finger pointing at what we like to call ultra orthodox Jews. I don't even understand why we have to use the word ultra in our own religion when it's not used in other religions about more more religious groups. Um, so that bothered me, and it bothers me that it feels like it's a trend on Netflix to have a lot of shows about the orthodox, not necessarily yeah. the most positive light. Right. I guess it seemed very well received though by everybody but me. Yeah. No. Well, actually, uh, I think I think it's it's sort of a mixed reaction, and I think we're going to hear about that tonight. I'm actually curious if there's anybody on this panel that actually really enjoyed it, but we'll we'll ask that individually. Let's get, let's go to you, Liat. Oh, hi. So I'm not a film critic, obviously, um, but I think the, what the film did is that it really brought up a lot of a lot of good issues. We've received hundreds of questions um, sparked by the series, do people really do this? Do you really do this? Um, why do people live like this? Um, but Judaism is about asking questions. We, The Talmud is made up almost exclusively of questions and answers. And the famous, famously the Passover Seder, where we really were encouraged always to ask questions. So I'm just thrilled that people are questioning and dealing with as many issues um, as they possibly can, because we really want to we want to deal with and grope with these these important concepts. Thank you, um, Judge Fryer. Tell us. So, in terms of how it's been viewed in my community, that's it's really like a non-issue. Most people in Barapak do not watch movies, and if they do, it, they really don't talk about it. So, I'll just share with you my reaction, if that's okay with you, as opposed that would to be great. okay. So, I was I was really offended. I found myself very offended on a personal level. I feel that to take a movie and with one brush stroke paint all Hasidim as insular, ultra extreme, devoid of love, devoid of happiness. It, 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 it took everything that's human out of us and made us look really bad on screen. The, the plot, the movie, the fiction, the excitement, the gun, the scenes, that, that it was a great movie. It was a great movie, but the fact that it took my community and made us look really bad, that, you know, I, I was trying to think like, how can I explain it to the average person? And I said, you know, if you're an insider and you grow up within the community and you're you're part of this and you raise your children this way there, there's there's so much happiness there's so much camaraderie there's so much simcha joy love being in the community and i i was you know i was in my kitchen when i looking at a 
a banana that was like just like left on the kitchen counter. One of the kids, the house is very busy now. So some of the kids ate a banana and just left the peel on the counter. And I said, look at that. Look at that peel. It's it's brown. It's wrinkled. It's shriveled. The fruit is gone. And someone just left it on the counter. And if I never saw a banana and someone says to me, here's a banana. What do you think about bananas? I would say it's the most unappealing fruit. And that's what I felt that it, what, the, what, what the movie did. It took the term Hasidism. It took a whole community. It took centuries of a certain lifestyle and just narrowed it down to four hours. Um, and it was fiction. Most of the scenes that, that were in the movie couldn't have taken place. That's not to say that there aren't problems in certain homes. We're human beings. There are some people that have problems with mothers or with fathers or with mothers-in-law or with teachers or with a college teacher. But this was the story of everything that could go wrong in anybody's life, in any community, went wrong with this girl, Esty, and it was all because of her Satmar Hasidic background. And to me, that's, that's not good filmmaking. It's not a nice story. And that's why I'm speaking up. <laughs> that's how I felt about it. Great. Um, I mean, Judge Fry, do you, do you watch a lot of TV or film? Not at all. Not at all. In fact, it wasn't, I, I, I was really provoked into watching it when one of my good friends who was from the greater Jewish community, I, I don't know, I don't like to classify people. So a good friend of mine, I don't, I don't know what he observes or what, what he doesn't observe, but he's proudly a Jewish man. And we talk a lot because we're both involved in the world of emergency medicine. And he said to me, you know, my wife and I watched the movie and it's so not what it's like hearing it from you. So tell me, he says, you know, what do you think about it? So I said to him, Michael, you tell me in one question, what's the biggest question that you have after watching the movie? And he says, my wife and I just want to know, are all Hasidic marriages arranged and are they loveless? Loveless. Loveless, yeah. And I, and I had to say, that's not true. While they're all arranged, you don't really understand what arranged means. And that's a whole conversation. And once I would explain to him what it means to be arranged, I would say they are not loveless. And then again, I can only speak really for myself, yeah. my family, my friends, whatever I see, whatever I know is what I can share. So that's how I feel. Perfect. Um, Pearl, let's go to you. Tell us reactions. Hi, first of all, I just want to say um, this panel is so overwhelmingly awesome that I got a little nervous. I'm not going to lie. Um, so thank you so much for having me as part of it. And especially under the auspices of Aish, um, knowing my work and I just, I'm super honored. And um, I have a lot to say about this actually. And I thought I wouldn't. So, you know, a little bit about myself. Um, I, for those who don't know, I have a little experience with kind of navigating the worlds, if you want to put it as simply as two worlds, which it isn't, which is part of what we're referring to tonight, which is aren't just like the Hasidic world and the not Hasidic world, you know, it's, so I kind of lived in a world where I'm looking at the complexities, living, literally living that line and doing it with a great amount of care and compassion to, for both celebrating the life I was raised in and, and embracing it and embracing what it taught me and continues to teach me because I'm still here. I'm in my father's house right now, um, you know, and the world that I live in. Um, predominantly where I also celebrate and embrace what I very clearly and with a lot of decision, which I'll come back to in a second, have, uh, I'm living. So, you know, a little background, I was in A Life Apart, which was one of the first films that came out about classism in America. And I was the person who walked the streets and decided to get an education. Um, and they did a really terrific job talking about much more complexly, I think, about how the Holocaust fits into the question of rebuilding lives after the war as Hasidic Jews. And, you know, how do you do in a place like America? It's not the only place, but it's certainly by, you know, statistically at that point anyway, the largest. So um, I was in that film. And then I did my own film called Divan about how a couch takes me back into the Hasidic ancestry of, of my family and, and connects me more with my father in a way I never thought was possible. 
after I had fallen into the world of, of which is now more more acceptable, but at that time, you know, I went to college and it, that was unheard of then. So, you know, this is the 80, late 80s, early 90s, and, you know, which, uh, you know, is, is what's so powerful about filmmaking and storytelling is that now that's being addressed. You know, Turo College was just kind of coming up then. You know, you look at someone like Judge Ruffy Fry, who's like, you know, living her dream and finding her own voice within that community. Um, you know, and that obviously is made possible by so many um, organizations and commitments by the rabbis and the women who are um, leaders in the community saying, how do we address some of these needs, right? At that time, I was one of the first, let's say, because I'm third generation, second generation were the ones born to Holocaust survivors. There's a different kind of struggle. So I'm like the first real kind of American, first generation American born here as a Hasidic Jew. Yes, I was raised in what you might call a Satmar home, but my father chose um, um, the Munkacher Rebbe to follow because they were here in Brooklyn, in Borough Park. So he was more there, but he was still very much Satmar or Tush or, or Nitrous. Like it's not, I keep going to the same thing. It's not just one thing. You can't just say, the Satmars are the Hungarian Hasidim who are all uh, survivors of the Holocaust. It's not true. And you can also say that there was no Hasidic community here in the United States before they came here. So it was not developed only by survivors of the Holocaust. So some of those elements of you know the research that went into this was questionable for me. And then since then, I've gone into a little bit more the fictionalized part of it because of the stuff that we're all talking about tonight, which is trying to look at more of the complexity. A lot of them are highly subtle. Um, one of them looks at girls in Hasidic, in Hasidic camp coming to terms with their identity as, as, as sexual and sensual beings. And another one looks, the one that's not out yet, is about a Holocaust teacher who is like writing poetry and loves her Hasidism and she doesn't want to leave it. And, but she loves her poetry, you know, and so this is the kind of stuff that I think what I'm hearing is what is felt lacking, I think, um, right. in unorthodox. So you're asking me the reaction I'm seeing. So the reaction from those near and dear in the community, I think is very similar to what I've just heard, um, which is that it's outright offensive. And the reaction from people not in the community are asking me, oh my God, is this what you went through? This is terrible, no wonder. And uh, you know, how awful, and now I have to do all this backtracking and just be like, you know, watch my movies, you know what I mean? So, you know, p part of it has to do with how, I, I have to say, not to disagree, but I have to say it's a beautiful piece of filmmaking, actually. Okay. Um, it follows, the, from a, as a filmmaker, I feel like it follows the rules of one main character having a very deep desire that she thinks she wants, and then she learns that can't be what she wants, she has to follow what she needs. So um, it works well. Yeah, I, that don't work for me. I have to say, and this is like, you know, some of the reactions I'm getting, like you're asking from filmmakers, is she doesn't actually make the decision to go to the music conservancy. It just kind of happens, and that's just not how it happens when you leave the community, which we can talk more about later, or when you transition is the word they use. So that's the reaction that I'm hearing. I'm personally not offended by it. I think right. it's beautifully done. I just feel like it's one person's story or at least what they created because it actually isn't even Deb's story. Yeah. Um, and I think like, um, you know, one of you had said earlier, it's really important to use this as a conversation piece, which is so, what we're doing. Yeah, exactly. And um, and by the way, just in terms of um, keeping this going, I think um, we're going to, uh, we have another two minutes on this section. So I want to keep this moving along and I want to cover a lot of ground here. So I'm going to ask you guys to try to keep your answers to like a minute or two so that we can get through everything. Um, and, uh, you know, I think I think the question I'm going to go to you, Liz, on next is, do you feel there's a double standard um, in in, you know, against uh, Orthodox and uh, or Hasidic people? Well, I mean, clearly, because I don't think that people would be comfortable making this kind of movie about a different group. I, I'm not even comfortable pointing out which group I mean. But I think there are groups that we all know that you you wouldn't make this movie about. And if you did, everyone I know wouldn't be saying you have to watch this. Look how terribly women are treated there. <laughs> women, there are issues, as we know, for women in all parts of the world, uh, in the religious world, in the secular world. Um, all, we're, we're in the middle of this huge Me Too movement. So I guess 
yeah, I found it, I found it highly, highly unfair. And in terms of just not, and again, not disagree, because I'm so fascinated by every everybody on this panel and what they've said, and I agree with so much of it. But in terms of the filmmaking, I guess that's actually what really bothered me about this movie, because the filmmaker made such clear choices, um, since it's not exactly, you know, to the letter of what was written. So there were so many choices that she made that I found very sledgehammery and particularly strong on a message that was very anti orthodox in a very unfair double standard way where the rest of the world was being held up as this sort of enlightened Mecca. And then there was this backwards area in Brooklyn and it, it felt actually to, to me and no offense to the filmmaker, although I guess offense, you know, really like I was being hit over the head with something in a very unsubtle way. Um, and I found it have a huge double standard and it offended yeah. me deeply. Yeah. It, it's Sorry. interesting. I mean, I, I, I find that um, there, there are many people who, um, who are either happy with the filmmaking and unhappy with the portrayal um, and a various mixture of the two. Um, before we move on, I'll just ask uh, Judge Ferrer if you have any uh, anything to add on that question about, um, about double standards. I think we've come to accept it. I think that we know that people are always out to try to make us look bad out in the media. And that's something that bothered me more than it bothers most people in Borough Park. Most people just accept it as a given and say, we're too busy, we don't really care, we serve God, we live a religious life, and if people don't like it, we just move on, we don't care. And But I do care. I do care because I do love my community and I know that we're not perfect because nobody's perfect. But I think that when you take the time to explain who we are and what our practices are, I found that most people come to respect us. So there is a double standard that doesn't surprise me. But I think shows like what you're doing right now is is wonderful, and it will break that double standard. Do you, um, just to follow up on that, do you feel that uh, your world is really cut off, separated, insular, as it as it was depicted in the show? Um, and if so, why? And if not, why not? Well, that that's a real big word because there are so many different degrees of insularity. And most of us make a choice how insular we want to be. So I have six children, and each one of those children chose a different degree of insularity. And, and that's how we are in the community. Some people are more to the right, some people are more to the left. But by and large, we are an insular group. But that could be a good thing, because everybody that's raises a family will make a choice what they'll let their children watch. If you let them go on the internet, you're going to exercise some form of control, some form of self-containment. So maybe we have a lot more rules where, where I live in Borough Park, but I have seen that the rules work. And I always say it's the rules that I was grown, that I was raised with that really helped keep me on my path and really propel me to achieve what I wanted to achieve. I, I, all those distractions that many people have when you live in a very open society, I really didn't have those. And when I would explain to people my restrictions, whether it was my restriction of not shaking hands with men, now everybody gets it. Now with COVID, they all say, oh, we learned from Judge Fryer how we can get along without shaking hands. <laughs> I found that when I would explain my rules, the reaction I would get is, thank you so much. I mean, one attorney that I met told me there's a thick black line between us, Rachel, and I know I will never go over that line. So insularity, if exercised appropriately, could really reap many benefits. What do you think, Pearl? Um, okay, I've actually unmuted my mic, which we're gonna metaphorically say I'm gonna unmute certain things too. <laughs> Um, let me just preface this by saying I'm coming from a place of privilege, right? Um, I have very loving parents. I have a very loving family. Um, and they and I, and we have all come a long way, but, um, I'm not LGBT. I'm not struggling with trying to keep a child with me in a terrible divorce. Um, I'm not up against a community that would possibly make that difficult for their own faith-based reasons without judgment here, I'm just calling, just speaking back. Um, and, you know, so keep that in mind when I speak this evening, because knowing that, you know, it, it actually made it possible for me to do a film like Vivan. I think about that all the time, um, where I didn't have to face any of 
the realities of what insularity and that black line that you can't cross can do to someone who doesn't feel like they fit in. This is not whether or not unorthodox did justice to that. I mean, there's so many issues um, with that particular film and the imbalance of both worlds. This is speaking directly to your question about the insularity and my own personal experience. So it took um, a level of humanity and respect and dignity to be able to find a way to connect in my case. And again, I keep saying I'm coming from a place of privilege. Please understand that. But there are so many people in great amount of pain for very legitimate reasons that could be tied to what happens when insularity is taken to an extreme. Um, and so I have to say, the work that you're doing here at Aish and so many others, even within the Hasidic community, are doing amazing work trying to explain that subtlety that needs to happen even in that space. So it becomes less of a black line, more of a gray space where people can find their voice and stay within the community. And if, if I may, I'd like to talk one second about Sarshnir. It'll just be like a minute. But we're working on this new project to tell Sarshnir's story. And we literally just talked about this last night with um, Na Naomi Seidman, who actually wrote a book about her, a, a book about her, and uh, this wonderful filmmaker from A Life Apart, Menachem Daum, and we're kind of exploring what it might look like. And one of the things Sarshnir said was that when she started a school for girls, if she wanted to make sure that they didn't feel they couldn't be all of these wonderful things and also from. And I just think that that element might have gotten a little forgotten. I don't know because I'm not like trying to find an antidote to the situation, but you know, in the level of fear that comes with the global village, with assimilation, with losing faith, that fear I think reached probably its apex in the 90s and early 2000s. And now I think there's so much conversation like this one about how to deal with that sense of insularity, which is extremely real for some people and, and almost life-threatening for some people. And in my case, this led to these incredible conversations I still have with my own family and my friends and, and my world, both inside and outside um, the perceived world of Hasidism. Uh, Leah, do you have anything uh, you'd like to add to this idea about yeah. insularity? So I grew up I grew up in Israel in a neighborhood that had people of all different religious levels. And all through my schooling, I thought that everybody got along with everybody. We were all friends, irregardless of the schools that we went to, or uh, some of us kept Shabbat, some of us didn't, and, and we all got along. And it was only after school when I, I, when I went to the Israeli army and I met unobservant Jews, if I could call them that, who were so insulated, they'd never met an observant Jew before. And I couldn't believe it. And then I was in Jerusalem studying and I met, you know, as you see in this, in this movie, many very observant Jews who had never met a secular Jew before. So my, well, you know, one of my main passions is really trying to, to bridge that and to, and to introduce people to each other and to be open um, to, to, to the other, so to speak. But really, I think there's a range of how isolated every society is. Um, for me, the Jewish concept is that everything is part of God's world. And we need to figure it out how we want to integrate it into our lives. So speech, you know, we're all talking now. Speech is not negative or positive. It's all in how we use it. And sexuality is also neutral. We can, uh, we can deal with it in a healthy, happy fashion um but you know we have chastity completely on one side and pornography and exploitation all the way on the other neither of them is good so i think that when we talk about being insular and, and integrating other things into our world and again as judge fryer said really it's a universal issue every society every home is challenged with what they want to bring in you know whether it's junk food or junk tv um and for me the show really highlighted that, that challenge, that each of us as an individual is constantly throughout our life making that decision to see if something we feel it will benefit us physically, emotionally, um, spiritually, and to choose that, to bring that in, or to move it out and to be more insular. So we're all dealing with that really in our lives. Um, with the last minute in, on this subject, I wanted to ask you know, Pearl in, in, uh, in 30 seconds, Tell me this, because um, I know you walked away. I don't know if that's the way you put it, but um, from from a Hasidic community, 
Do you feel that you were trapped, forced to stay? Do you feel that you were shunned in some way when you did leave? Um, I can hard, like wholeheartedly say that if anything, it's the opposite. There's like the constant, you know, you sure, you know, that you could still, you know, I, I don't know. It's a tough question to answer because again, my, I think my family's a little less what we see on, let me back before I can say this. There are many tes testimonial and witness books that are out there about people who MMRs that have gone through this that really talk about the extremes. Um, I'm not one of them. So, you know, for me, I'm really straddling both places. So I've never felt shunned, to answer it specifically, um, at all, if not the opposite. And I'm always encouraged to um, consider, I don't know if a return to Hasidism is realistic. I think we're all realistic human beings. But, I, you know, in some ways, I've never left Hasidism. I feel like it's part of my storytelling. I feel it, I, it's very much part of how I was educated. I love how I was educated. So I, I don't know if the turn would quite be right. I, I'm really one of those more unique cases where there isn't that extreme. And don't forget, you know, I haven't gotten married yet. So a lot of those choices wouldn't be in the face of anybody. And, and I think even now it would be fine. So again, I, I keep saying this, but I'm coming from a place of privilege. I'm, I mean, you know, you're asking me these questions, I can tell you my friend's stories, but I myself have not been. And there are people that have been on the couch on Divan that talk about how they were shunned. And, and even in those cases, years later, work has been done to try and connect for some of them, not all of them. But yep. the is real for those that are. Yep. Um, so uh, I think we're midway through the hour. I'm going to remind you guys that if you have questions uh, for the Q&A, please email them to info at hny.com. That's info at AISHNY.com. Uh, so the next 10 minutes, we're gonna cover the subject of sexism in the Hasidic community or in the Orthodox community. And I guess my question, Liz, um, you know, do you do you see in the Orthodox community this uh, idea that women are second class citizens? Are they treated as terribly as the show depicts? Um, you know, what do you how do you how do you view that, Liz? Well, you know, I'm 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 not orthodox. I know, so you're not. I, know but, I don't know how I would answer that question. Well, I I guess the question uh, to you is, you are you are uh, you you do certainly, you know, in your support of age and in, in your, um, you know, the, you are certainly aware of, uh, you know, and obviously, or you know, the the, the series did affect you in a certain way. And I'm wondering if partly it's because you don't feel it does accurately um, depict the status of women in orthodoxy or in, Has in Hasidism. So I can, I can only answer in that as these women are much uh, more well-versed in it than, than I am for this specific question. But I would say that it seems impossible to me that anything could be that one dimensional. In fact, I would say, you know, my experience as a human being would tell me that can't possibly be true. That, you know, there this is one person's story as told with a very, very, very distinct and obvious in my mind um, viewpoint of the filmmaker. Um, you know, even more so perhaps than the actual story. I I don't know. Um, yeah. but but I do know that in the Orthodox community, just like in the non-Orthodox community, women are treated in many, many, many different ways. So I, I you know. Uh, you know, from from the absolute worst to the absolute best. So I, I, you know, that 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 would be the only way I could answer that question. The reason the film offended me was because I found it so one dimensional. I found it so heavy handed, um, and I found it went in with a viewpoint, and it hammered that viewpoint for four hours, um, and it juxtaposed it with some things that we can talk about later that I found particularly offensive, like that 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 was being juxtaposed with uh, modern day Berlin. Um, yeah, we're going to get to that. To my core, but we'll get there later. So I don't yeah. I don't think that answer, I, I think these other women are far more yeah. qualified than I am. And I love Fair. answering questions, but Fair I don't know. Um, I think, so let's go, let's go to you, Judge Fryer. I, I, I think it's a question, you know, the question that we're asking here is a question that I think uh, I'm seeing to be probably one of the bigger ones surrounding this, which is what is the role of women? You know, they're always in these, in these um, narratives, Orthodox Hasidic women are are often pictured as second class citizens, second secondary to men. 
Um, you know, there was, used to be an expression, you know, sure, the man is the head, but the woman is the neck, you know, pointing the man in the right direction. So do you feel that way? I mean, obviously, you're an unusual, um, you know, it's unusual for a Hasidic woman, certainly to be a judge, but to have a career that's um, so public facing and, you know, especially unusual that you're exposed to um, such a unique part of New York life. So I'm just wondering, you know, firstly, based on your particular experience, but then secondarily, what's the norm? Is there, you know, are women second class citizens? No, <laughs> I'm not second class. Um, I wasn't raised by a mother who's second class. I come from a family of strong women. Um, and, and what I really see is that the women really are the ones that run the home and make many decisions. Um, I do think there are many men out there in all communities who have disorders and sometimes try to take advantage of women. But I've spent many years doing work in family court when I was a lawyer. I've sat in criminal court, domestic violence bench. I've I've seen, I've been around the block and seen a lot um, about the diversity of what goes on in different homes all across New York. So if I have to look again in, after looking out and looking how women are treated here in Borough Park, no, I do not think that women are second class citizens. There are times when some people will try to use the religion to perhaps have an upper hand and that goes into the whole reason why I formed as Rest Nashim and why I advocated for these women who wanted to serve as emergency responders, because I felt that a small select group of men were taking Judaism and distorting it for their own vested interest. That's not the religion, that's not Judaism, and it's not the way Hasidus is supposed to be. But yes, most women are behind the scenes, don't think of don't go out like I do, but that's because it's my choice. And because I thank God had the opportunity, I do have a very supportive family. And I also have found that many women, regardless of being from the Hasidic community or the modern Orthodox community, even if they've gone to college, don't practice what they have their degrees in and they just prefer staying home. So a lot of it is just about human nature of men and of women. In terms of myself and the women that I grew up with, we were never second class citizens. Liat, what do you think about that? Um, do you do you feel that the role of women in Judaism as a whole is um, is different than men? Is that something that you feel is a good thing, a bad thing, um, sexist? So when we ask if Judaism is sexist, I think we, we need to look at what we're asking. Um, if we're asking our men better than women, um, then the answer is that we Judaism perceives both men and women to have the same goal in life, to develop their soul and achieve their utmost potential. And that is true for men and for men and women equally. But regarding roles, I think we need to change our perspective a bit. So I look really historically and we see that in all societies, there were traditionally male roles and female roles. The men um, worked outside of the home, they built society and commerce and business, and women were responsible for the home, not just the homemaking, but the raising, raising of children more importantly. Um, and men's role was considered to be more successful. You were a success if you earned a lot of money, if you had um, power and honor. Um, and when those roles first opened up to women um, in the beginning and middle of the 20th century with World War II and World War II, and women flocked to, um, to, men's, to men's stereotypical men's roles um, when they had the chance to build that professional life. So men and women were working outside the home. And what we see happen towards the end of the 20th century is that since nobody was taking care of family, completely, um, a lot of it crumbled. Um, people were unhappy, children were unhappy. Uh, really, the, the people who were the most happy were the therapists because everybody, um, everybody was in therapy. Um, Judaism has always said that the home role, the developing of people was central, is central. Men um, go out to work um, as a necessity, but really a successful man is not a rich lawyer. 
but but rather one who is a good person, a loving father, um, a doting a doting husband. Um, so you know, nowadays in society, we're trying to figure out that balance again. Where we're realizing, wait, you know, work and society outside the home professionalism is important, but the home is more important because if we don't put effort into our families, into our children, into people to develop them um, correctly and, and in a healthy way, then society falls apart. So we're trying to, to balance it all. What we see in the Hasidic world and, and in much of the Orthodox world is that is that that focus never changed. <laughs> it's still, we still have men and women focused on what's always been most important. And that is developing people to be their, their best selves. Was yeah. that portrayed really in, in the film? I don't know, but I think we also didn't really see so much of, of, um, of the dynamics of what, what really, what really happened. But, but certainly the, the emphasis of the importance of the home uh, means that women who are focused on that role or men who are focused on that role cannot be second class citizens because what they're doing is clearly the most important, um, we're, important job. We're, we're going to we're going to get to the topic of fundamentals in a second but there was one area of this that i think a lot of people um focused on which is the shaving of at when uh, etsy sh shaved her head and i you know i realized that each hasidic community has different um you know uh, approaches to to modesty when it comes to women covering their hair and satmars in particular do shave the women do shave whereas many other in fact i'm not aware of any other hasidic sect that does do that but um, I, I'm going to ask this to uh, I'll throw this out to you, Judge, again, because I think you're the um, the the only one on the panel right now that is um, in, in the Hasidic community. Uh, can you talk about hair shaving and sort yeah. of what uh, a little bit give a little context here for the people who may not be so familiar with it? And, um, you know, why that's important both to the woman and to the man. And um, and that moment in the film, how did it strike you? Okay. Um it struck me as being very unfair and unrealistic. In my own family, it's a matter of choice. Some of my children do and some of my children don't. We all, all the married children, all the married girls cover their hair, but how they do it is a personal choice between husband and wife. And the women who do it, do it wholeheartedly by and large. Of course, there always are exceptions, but there is this based on Kabbalah that there is, they'll merit good children. And the ones that do it, do it willingly. Some, pe some people do it right away when they get married. Some people do it later. And some people who did it at first don't do it later on. Very often it's the men who don't want it, but the women who do want to shave their hair. So it, you really can't in one sentence define what it means to everybody. It's a very personal choice. Maybe there are some, some neighborhoods where it's more um, expected, but when we talk about Hasidim, and we talk, like Pearl had mentioned that before, even when you say a word, a word like Satmar, I have cousins that are Satmar. I had my first client, my first client when I was an attorney, I hung up my shingle, were the Satmar Hasidim in, in Kiryas Yol. And they were the ones who were who put me on the map because they were so open-minded and didn't have a problem with retaining me as their attorney. So. To, to, to say Satmar and then say across the board what everybody does, you're talking about thousands upon thousands of people. You have Satmar Monroe, you have Satmar Williamsburg, you have Satmar Barapak, you have the from the two different rabbis, and there's just so many different people in that group and wonderful, wonderful people. So everybody does what they feel is right, and most of them probably do, but most of them do it willingly. and for a girl to be standing there by the mirror and to be crying and to be bawling, I don't think that's the way it happens by most of the people. Maybe there are exceptions to the rule. Now, I don't want to say everybody, but I could just tell you what it's like in my family. And in that's my family, the ones who do it, do it willingly, and they feel this is how they are serving God. This is what they are doing and how they are observing the mitzvah. Even how we cover our hair. We wear different, there's different wigs. Some people wear, wear scarves, some wear hats, some wear wigs and hats, some wear wigs and scarves. So it's so hard to really explain to people who don't really understand who we are, why we do what we do. There's, there's the Jewish law, 
then there's the minhag, the custom, and then there's the tradition. And then there are people who say, hey, I didn't grow up with my mother doing it, but I want to take it upon myself. I want to do it. I want to do what I can, and I want to make my husband happy. So it's really a very personal, personal decision. It's not something that most people will talk about. They, it's think, something between a husband and a wife. I think, um, I think you actually started to answer my next question, which um, I guess I'll, I'm going to throw out to you, Pearl, uh, which is that, you know, is there, is there or was there in your experience room for individuality within the uh, Hasidic system? Do the rabbis control everything? Great question. Um, it sounds a lot like the kind of questions I'm getting now um, from people who have not had these experiences. So I'm just going to build on what Judge Fryer was just saying earlier, and it will tie into the question of, of my experience if there is any sexism or second class citizenship. Um, I think it's really important at this point to talk about the question of faith and how it fits into this larger system. I mean, you can't, you really can't be in one faith-based world or non-faith-based world and judge another one for what it believes and doesn't believe, unless of course there's human rights violations and et cetera, which of course uh, we could talk about whether there is or isn't. I I don't think, I mean, this is how I explain it to people who are from the outside. You know, it's, it's not like anyone's forced to stay in the community. You pay a price if you leave, if certain things are valuable to you. And if you do have children or you love that world and you identify a certain way and can't fit in, then there's a price and difficulty and a struggle. Um, and if you have children, you want to keep them. I mean, again, I'm not a mother, so I can only imagine that pain. Um, but for me, it, 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 what, I, what I perceive is that you are looking at a faith-based community that believes in things called koisha, which is that women do not sing publicly, a more intimate space for women. Women are the primary educators, and that is very guarded for in a number of different ways, including not having public figure presence and so on. So what's perceived as second-class citizens is not exactly the, the way that, that, you know, if you're really studying the, the, the faith and the pedagogy, it doesn't fit that. On the other hand, it's easy to look from the outside or if it doesn't work for you, and then think that I don't belong here. This isn't working for me and I can't hear my voice and I need to do X, Y, or Z. And then you must face some changes. And I think that's up for anyone born into any system that doesn't work for them. Again, taking out the, those that are in situations that have human rights situations I'm talking, and abuse and, and so on and dysfunction. I'm talking about commu you know, a community health functions. And Judge Fryer has said this a number of times. There are different, these are issues in almost any fill in the blank based community, culturally based, religious based, and, and you know, um, if they come from a particular country, there are certain traditions. So in, in the, in, in it, you know, I'm trying not to be apologetic, but at the same time, I just think it's very clear if this audience doesn't know this to understand that's what we're talking about. So once within that system, I think there are a lot of people that feel unheard. And then there, I think there are a lot of people that take advantage of their power as you heard Judge Fryer talk about. Yep. So this is one of the things I love about what Judge Fryer has done with starting this women's only EMT program, with being out there with her education, with her faith, with her motherhood and, and embracing her Hasidism in, in the way that she feels empowered to do so. And, you know, without giving away too much personal information, I mean, I look at my sister-in-laws and I look at my nieces and I do not think of them as second class citizens. And I know they don't think of them. And then let's talk about, you know, grandmothers, great aunts, you know, and are there examples of people that didn't feel that they got their voice heard? Sure. And you would have that not only anywhere, but when you have it in a situation like this, where if you love your faith, it can be extremely painful because you want to stay in that world or you love your family and you want to stay in that world, but no one's forcing you to. So the place of choice is there. It is not untrue though, that men are the public figures. And since if we are talking about unorthodox, I will say this, it is a, there's a clear, distance between how the Hasidic women are represented and how the women outside of the world are represented. They are so beautifully diverse when you get out in that world. And I think they really miss the mark, not showing the diverse diversity of women in the Hasidic world, not even just in, in Satmar and not Satmar, in yeah. orthodoxy or whatever you want to call it. There are certainly like pushy mother-in-laws that are pushing their nose where they don't belong. But is every single woman that 
lacking of love and compassion. And it just, it's not, it's not only not my experience, it's just not my, I don't think it's anybody's experience. I right. think we all have people in our worlds that disturb us. I mean, you know, I worked on a film about sex trafficking. So you know, I'm not coming from a place of like, everyone's happy. Even when I listen to those survivor stories, there's always someone or two people in their world that gave them a sense of loss or something when they had to leave that world that they were raised in or have, been, have gone through. So the life, you know. So it's so if, and I'm not I'm not comparing Hasidism to the life, but I'm saying if it's really that horrible, even then there's those strings. I mean, any therapist will tell you that that pulls them back into this world that was just so horrible for them because there were some that loved them. And I feel like they dropped it when they didn't show that. That's certainly not my experience of women in the Hasidic world. And it's one of the things that I take with me in the world that I live in is the way I was empowered to yep. be strong. I feel like my strength comes from, I'm, I'm too much for people in my world. Like they're like, yeah. well, like the Hasidish, or wait till you meet Hasidish women, you'll get it. We're strong, we're empowered to, to speak our voice. So again, I just wanna be really, really clear. I get that in some communities they go too far and so, there are issues. And then there are people like Judge Breyer who are trying to fight them. But in general, that's not, that subtlety that we all have in our lives about people that we know is here too, or, or there, or however you wanna look at it. Um, so, uh, just going to do a quick reminder that's scrolling along the bottom of your screen last few minutes to ask some questions. We're going to go to the last subject of the, um, of this panel before we go to the Q and A at nine o'clock. And, and, you know, Liz, this is, uh, what we promised we would get back to, which is what I think we're calling the Berlin sequence. And the Berlin sequence is both, uh, you know, I think encapsulates probably two areas. One is the way in which the Holocaust was handled in the show. And the second part of the Berlin sequence is this idea that the community there was just so open and embracing to um, SD and, you know, just, you know, just sort of how, you know, you felt that was a, an accurate portrayal or a fair portrayal. Well, uh, I mean, again, like, it's not like I'm intimately familiar with Berlin, but I do know, and I know about it. Well, most of us know about it. It was the uh, the scene of some of the most horrific crimes against humanity and against the Jewish people. Um, you know, unspeakable. Uh, so um, I thought it was strange that they chose Berlin, especially because I think I read that the, this book didn't even really end up in Berlin. So why Berlin? Um, and they held up Berlin as a place where you know anything and everything is possible and wonderful in this enlightened, sophisticated metropolis. Um, but again, to me, Berlin is a place where Jews were dragged from their homes while their neighbors pointed out, you know, pointed at them gleefully, marched to the, down the streets, their deaths. Um, just not that, that long ago. Uh, maybe some disagree with that. Um, and then there was that scene, if, if this is the moment to talk about it, there was that scene where she has this freeing moment in the, in the is it the Wansi Lake or is it the Wansi River? I, I, I don't even know because I just hear the word Wansi. And I only think of one thing, once again, and I've been there. Uh, Wansi is where the very, very famous conference happened in 1942, uh, where they all decided, you know, how efficiently and quickly they could kill all the Jews. And I've read the minutes and it's if we, you know, move them into the gas chambers every five minutes instead of every 10 minutes, we'll have much higher production rate. Um, it was held on that beautiful lake and that lake is rung by homes where wealthy Jews had their second homes before they were murdered. Uh, by the participants in that conference and all the, and many of the German participants as well. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I mean, honestly, like I, I can't put too fine a point on it. I, I guess I'm not being as, um, you know, as as polite about it, perhaps as my fellow fellow panelists, and I for that I apologize. But honestly, it offended me to my core. It, it shocked me that that would be the filmmaker's choice of juxtaposition. It, 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 it yeah, I almost without words, like without words. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, it was hard, you know, I didn't read the book, but it was, I, I, tried to, I, I tried to look at, you know, it, it, the book is, is positioned as a memoir, but when you read about the series, it is positioned as a fictionalized version. So my experience in developing underlying IP um, like this is that it very often departs entirely by the time it ends up on the screen. So it really is the you know writer director who um, should be answering these questions as to why those choices were made. Um, you know we have a few more minutes. 
Uh, I guess we'll do one more question. We'll ask this question to you, Pearl, about you know how you how you reacted to that sequence. Yeah, uh, two quick things. Um, you know, I thought about that question a lot when I was. Um, I've been. I traveled through. I lived in Hungary for a little while. I traveled in the Ukraine, um, and there's a lot of people that continue to live there, even in places of trauma. And some of the trauma they actually went through in the Holocaust or through the uh, not the pogroms, but the um, Einsatzgruppen and some of these like um, mass graves. And my question to these survivors a lot was, you know, how do you live here? How can you handle it? And their response, even. I'm talking about the older generation now is, well, where should I live? This is where I live. And I actually think that was handled well. I, I appreciated that. And I think like, you know, I think it's important to show that reality and not so much, um, you know, I think it's important to show that people struggle with a level of history that we as Americans don't fully get. And if we're not Native American, then we really don't get it. But, you know, this, or even African American, like we just don't get what some of these places feel like to someone who has been through a, a major trauma in our home space. And so I think that's something that I thought they handled well. What was tricky, and it is true in Deborah's story, she went to Berlin, that's where she went. But I think it's important for filmmakers to take on the responsibility of what they represent, not to the degree where they can't tell this story and say, this is her story, and I'm sorry that it isn't everyone's story, but it's hers, that's fine. But when you're picking um, up a subject that is so fraught, like the Holocaust, and then you're making her, her escape, which is a term I hate, but I get, I get it, and I get that it's real for a lot of people, but her escape is, you know, to a place like Berlin, it's got this wonderful roundness to it. And I think they dropped the ball on that too. Like, uh, I think this, this way of being like, you know, you lived in the past and now we're gonna show you how to let it go. I think that was highly problematic because a lot of the Germans I know don't just let it go. So again, I think that that would have been so beautiful if it could have been handled with a level of subtlety, some other things were handled. Like, for example, I think the men were written really interestingly in the Hasidic yeah, community. Did I you, I, mean, I found, I was like, how, these are written by women. This is all yeah. like a women, a frontally women run production. Why are the men so complexly written and the women are not? Why is Berlin like all of a sudden okay with the Holocaust? And, and it's just, it wasn't. I'm just, I'm just glad I, I, that it was a woman, that it was a woman who, who wrote it so that a men can't be blamed for, can't be blamed for that. Um, guys, I, I really want to, <laughs> I, I really want to thank you guys for uh, your participation. I know we're going to keep you here for another half hour for the Q&A. Uh, this has really been fantastic, and we're going to get to, to a lot of these questions, but I think this has really been um, an enlightening hour with you guys. Thank you. Uh, we're going to switch over. If You shouldn't lose your feed, but if you do, please head over to hnewyork.com slash forward slash unorthodox. So that's hny.com slash unorthodox. And a little plug is that next Thursday night, you should come back and hear the fascinating story of Stephanie Arnold, who flatlined for 37 seconds and what happened to her during that time. Please go to hnewyork.com for more information about that. And uh, we're going to slide into the Q&A for those that want to stay. Um, and I will... Uh, I will just tell you as we slide into this Q and A that um, we did get a ton of questions. Uh, they're going to be fed to me over our internal chat here. I apologize in advance that we can't get to everyone, especially seeing already, um, you know, how we've uh, didn't get to all the questions I had. But we'll go to the first question for Liat. Um, how does Orthodox Judaism see the balance between fervently keeping to your beliefs and religion and embracing secular society? Okay, so I think we kind of touched we touched on that we touched on that already. I um I think that I think that if we're focused on our purpose, um, on what we're we're trying, you know, what we're trying to achieve. So so people look at Judaism and they say, oh, it's an you know an archaic system of of laws of do's and don'ts, and you know just live in the world and be a good person, right? So. I think they're right in that we don't need we don't need Torah to, to to be a good person. Being a good person is a good thing, but the purpose really um, of Torah and and Judaism is to be great. Where, where Judaism is a structure that when it's when it's used properly, it's a guide to greatness. 
Uh, it's not a guide to greatness, though, by sitting on a mountaintop. We don't believe that that is the key to spirituality. The key to spirituality is to take all the tools that we've been given and within certain guidelines um, to, to live a spiritual life in the physical world. Um, and, and that's the balance that we're all always trying to um, trying to achieve to be, to be to be great in that way. And, and I think that maybe what happens in, in the more um, ultra <laughs> societies is that maybe we push too hard. You know, we push ourselves and we push our children, we push our friends, um, you know, be more spiritual, be more spiritual. And sometimes that balance can be lost where people lose, um, lose the focus of, of, of the actual physical world that, that we're, we're living in. Um, but, but I think that more often than not, if we, um, if we, if we're focused, like, like the judge said, if we're focused always on our goals and, and our priorities, then we can find that, um, then we can find that, that balance. And I think that in our actions, really, it's not, it's not just do's and don'ts where we're constantly robotic. You know, there's, um, you know, the Torah doesn't say you should eat broccoli, but if you eat broccoli, then you should appreciate it. You should recognize the gifts if you like broccoli that you the gift that you've um, that you the gift that you've been given. Um, and it's like that with everything in the world is that we're we're always trying to be focused on making the most of all the opportunities that we have. Um, thank you, Leah. I uh, our next question is uh, to Judge Fryer, and uh, it is: um, Would you accept my? daughter as an intern for no i'm kidding. my question um, uh is the um are you comfortable sharing which of any aspects of the show were accurately depicted oh, okay well so much of it was so inaccurate everything from the the shotgun scene the supermarket the the the, the show which is where they sit and talk and and marital intimacy they totally got that off what i thought was accurate was the nice dresses the pretty wedding gown um, things like that, the, the, the things that were really so unimportant, they got pretty, pretty well. The men's strimals, the fur hats were kind of stiff because they, mm -hmm. they, they you know, it looked like my husband's bad one. <laughs> but um, I think that's the only thing that really looked nice. The ladies were well dressed. The house was clean. They got the Pesach, the Passover night, pretty well good, you know, all the aluminum foil out there. So the things that were really not important um they got they were pretty accurate with that the white socks that the men wear that the rabbi was wearing um this is the first time i saw the men's payas look really authentic the beards not so much but again nothing that was really important or substantive or if you really want to show what the inner life of a hasidic home is like this is this is not the film to watch did you uh w w when um when he Cut his payas off. I forget his character name. Is it Yan Yankee? Yankee. Um, do you, could you imagine ever that happening in a Hasidic community? That a man would just cut his payas off in a in a in a moment of uh, you know pledging loyalty or devotion. I think it's possible. I think such a thing is possible when someone is so emotional and so disturbed and going through some trauma. I, I wouldn't say that it's not possible. But the whole story and the way it happened, and and I, it, it, in my opinion, it it was like you said, it was a, it was intriguing. The plot was great, the acting was great. But if you if you if the goal of the film is to give an accurate portrayal of a certain society, it has failed. Yeah. If it if the goal of the film was just to produce something that's entertainment whether you want to watch Snow White and have a good time being entertained, then that's that's one thing. But if you want to rate a show based on showing what true life is really like, and that's actually why I agreed to do the film 93 Queen. When the filmmaker approached me I, and she said, the story is great for a film, I said, no way. I said, we don't watch movies, let alone be in a film. And then she said to me that, the opportunity of showing the world what a true Hasidic home is like, how you have struggles and how you have faith and how there's love and there's support. This is the reason why I did it. Our life is com complex. It's not, just so, it's not so black and white like you, like you see, but 
No, they were, they were, like I said, accurate, I would say, is that, that wedding gown. It was a beautiful gown. That's Pearl. about it. <laughs> uh, Pearl, what about you? How did you... Uh... Um, I mean, from a perspective of a filmmaker, I think that they managed to do something really special about giving a sense of a location. Like you really, I feel like they captured a sense of Williamsburg, a sense of Berlin, I've been there too. Um, so I think that was good. I agree the casting was amazing and whoever yeah. knew Ellie Rosen worked with them on the Yiddish and I think that was very accurate. I also have to say, you know, along with everything else I said, I will also say that this really did very well capturing the darker and more difficult side of realizing that you may not fit into a world that you love. And I think they skipped the love part, unfortunately. So the part that kind of, I didn't buy the fact that she, that her mother left and she really wanted to stay there and be with her grandmother. I think that could have been developed more, that love for her grandmother. But, um, but the, but so that part lacked major authenticity, like all the stuff she did with her. And the, so we can miss it too when she's alone in both places. Yeah. They, but they definitely accurately portrayed the being alone there with, but missing the other piece. And on the other side, I think they accurately portrayed how scary it is and how unprepared, at least when, when I, you know, in the late eighties, early nineties, how much we had to teach ourselves in order to exist. I don't think that's as true anymore for uh, predominantly in the Hasidic world, but I, again, there are groups that are extremely isolated and, yeah. and that, that would be true. So, um, and, and yeah, yeah, mostly location. Like there's a real tonality to it that I thought yeah. was really powerful. That's an interesting perspective. Liz, let's go to you. And uh, this is a question that came in from someone who said they were surprised that a quote, secular person is defending Orthodox Judaism. Don't you think women are treated much better in the secular world? Um, first of all, my critique is really with this miniseries, with the way it was made, with the point of view that the filmmaker, which I keep saying, really, 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 I thought in a very heavy handed way, wanted to get across. That offended me as a Jew. Secular, I mean, secular, I don't know what that means. Reform, not reform, conservative. I, that just offended me as a Jew. As a woman, I don't necessarily think that women are treated better in the secular world than they are in the ultra orthodox world. I mean, aren't we living in a time where many of many people are claiming, I am not saying this is the case, but many are claiming that one in four, every woman that's sent off to college uh, is date raped. Uh, I mentioned this Me Too movement. It's it's going on like crazy. Everybody, every woman is accusing every man she's ever worked for of, of potentially raping her. Um, again, I'm not saying maybe true, may, may not be true, but so I'm confused as to why we think uh, at all that women are treated uh, much better in the secular world than in the religious world. I would have no way of judging that, but I presume it not to be the case. Wow, um, interesting, interesting um, angle in there. Uh, I would say, so Leah, let's go to you about a question that came in. How do religious Jews look at non-religious Jews and, and non-Jews? Um, what is your, and this is it's actually a question that I, I was, debating earlier with a friend of mine about this idea that Jews are, you know, the chosen people, whether they've deemed themselves that or whether other people have deemed that upon the Jews. Um, so, you know, how, how do you feel that religious Jews look at, at outwardly um, at, at non-religious and non-Jews? So, you know, I think one of the basic premises for me um, in the in the greater Jewish community is is not to judge, is that we can never really know um, who a person is and what he's achieved um, just purely from purely from the outside. The Talmud specifically tells us, you know, you never know whose blood is redder. We don't know whose life, so to speak. No one's life is worth more than than anybody else's. And we each start at a certain point and are working our way um, through the challenges, each one what we've been given, and, and trying to be the best people, the best people that we, that we can be. Having said that, I think also that the concept of chosen people has been very misunderstood um, by a lot of people and often, unfortunately, by, by, religious, by religious Jews as meaning that someone who upholds 
the religion is chosen or is worth more um, than than someone else. Um, my understanding of that is that is that really, you know, we do say that that we've heard God's word and that we claim to be living it, and we have to do our utmost to do that. But when we mess up, so to speak, then we then we need to be better. You know, being Jewish means to be an example of living a godly life. And part of that is also recognizing others and um, honoring other people for who they are in the life that they lead. Um, and I certainly can say for myself that I have met the most incredible people, really spiritual, beautiful, smart, beautiful inside, smart people on, on the entire on the entire spectrum of Judaism and non-Jews as well. And I think we have to respect and learn from every person that we meet. Well, I know what my perspective is on this, considering um, I met Rabbi Jacobs and I met at a nursery school called Community Church and then met 30 odd years later uh, as um, observant Jews. So I think, um, you know, with that perspective, I would actually love to hear from Judge Fryer how not just you, I think the community typically looks at non-religious Jews. I think, um, you know, there's a lot of sensitivity around the fact that people who've experienced religious Jews in New York may feel that um, they are dismissive or, um, you know, uh, and, and how do you react to that? Sorry about the background noise. That's my radio going on. <laughs> That's what makes that. it fun. Yeah. Um, so we're taught that it like like um Liat said before, everybody is created with the, with a telemelo Kim. Everybody has a purpose for being created. We're human beings, we're not supposed to be judgmental. No no pun intended for that. And um I think that you see a lot of warmth and camaraderie in the Hasidic community when there are people who are from the outside and they come they want, they come to visit or they come to explore. I know I've had many times around my Shabbos table, people from outside the religious community come and my family has been always very warm and very welcoming. So I think that we understand and we know that everybody has a purpose. Everybody has something that we could learn from and that we can give and we can share. So that's, that's my experience. That's what that's what I see. I uh, I've muted my mic. Um, so uh, so we're going to go to Pearl with the next question. Is it possible for a woman who doesn't want to dress the norm in Hasidic community to still stay in the community? And if Ooh, not, I'm so glad you're asking that. Wait, well, what's I, I don't get, I don't get any credit for this question, but I am glad you are so happy. Mm -hmm. What was the if not part? Oh, just just if not, why not? Um, so, <laughs> I'm glad you asked that question because I forgot to say something earlier because I was kind of getting off on the whole women in power, women in power to speak. And of course, again, keep in mind, there's a group that, that don't allow that for women, but predominantly that's my experience. So I don't know if you guys know this, um, in addition uh, to some of the other things we talked about, there's a whole Instagram world around, and Les, you must know this, around um, reconsidering Swedish fashion, how to make, like we talked about earlier, this is very faith-based, this community, and you cannot judge people for what they deeply believe as long as they're not hurting others, right? And so there's a lot of tzinius rules, uh, for those who don't know what that is, that's a level of modesty for men and for women, um, you know, so we can have that conversation another time. But for, for women who want to keep those rules and be fashionable, there's kind of this whole Instagram explosion around women owning their own businesses, becoming designers, um, certainly with the wigs. I mean, some rabbis feel it's gone too far, some, you know, et cetera. But there are women that are kind of like, one of them's my niece that has her own, you know, wig making company. And so back to like women in power and running their own businesses. But can women dress how they want? My, I don't live in this world, but I'm surrounded by people that do. And I get the sense that again, if if you live in this world and have chosen to do so, you make it work in the way that speaks your language. So if you wanna be more kind of edgy or whatever your look and feel is, sure. If you're not comfortable wearing those clothes and that's your reason for 
making this huge break out of a world that might be super meaningful to you, that's your choice, you know? And again, there's a price to pay. I mean, I'm not trying to be cavalier about it, but um, I still wear black. I'm like, I feel like sometimes I dress like not to be, you know, Mahavdol, but like, I feel like I, I dress like a Hasidish Rebbe, like I'm always in black and I'm always like wearing the same thing, you know, um, same kind of that's outfit. You live in New York. But that could be because I'm in New York, exactly. Um, but yes, I think that women can absolutely, um, my experience has been that the women I've known in the Hasidic world, and there's certainly many, they dress how they want, you know, you, the kind of what they believe is modest. Um, this is a question that, that actually came up that I thought was an interesting one. Um, is it true that if a mother has a young child and wants to leave the community, that she has to leave the child behind? Uh, judge Fryer, is that something you've experienced? Well, as a judge, I really can't speak about the law or cases or you know things that are politics. So, um, in general, I think the decisions about child care is what's the best interest of the child. I think that's about the most I could say. Um, yep. I think many times it's a case by case basis, and um. I mean, I, 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 let me clarify the question. In the in the in the Hasidic community, when we we see a lot of these stories about people leaving, women leaving who have children, um, is the is the custody battle um, usually about whether the parent is staying within the community and the community gets to keep the child? Is that I think that's the question. The few cases that I that I've heard of when there were custody battles, a lot of it just boiled down to money and power, who had more money and who was gonna fight more. So those were those were cases with bad outcomes. Um, I don't know if there is a typical, like I said, it, it these things are really so case by case, you know, the basic, I don't know if there's just like one rule that I can just say about custody battles over children. Okay. Maybe someone else can do a better job. Um, so, so Liz, I'm going to go to you uh, with with the next question. Do you think that unorthodox, in a way, fuels anti-Semitism, which is on the rise today? Um, you know, there. Were, you can also answer this question sort of in the context of I think what's um, what's uh, you know what's going on with with, with the more recent anti-Semitism. Where uh, Jews are, you know, were called up by Mayor De, uh, Mayor De Blasio. Um, you know, how do you think in the current climate, unorthodox adds or subtracts from that? Well, I think even in your question and the way you framed it, which I completely agree with, um, the answer is there. Yes, in a time when anti-Semitism is on the rise, particularly against the religious community, where we're seeing that, you know, random acts of violence. Um, you know, all the time when we have a mayor that said, basically, you Jews, we won't tolerate this anymore. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm at that point, you know, obviously particularly horrified uh, to see a movie like Unorthodox gain so much popularity. Um, I, I don't, it, it's sort of an old fashioned saying that we used to say, you know, and my grandparents said, my parents said, is this movie good for the Jews? No. It's really, really bad for the Jews. Um, so I don't, from that from that lens, it's another reason why I I don't like this one dimensional, in my mind, very, very unfair, uh, very potentially, potentially, I guess I'd even say the word dangerous um, movie. Although I agree that all viewpoints should be shown and it's a free country and I believe in free speech and this filmmaker has every right to make this movie and to make it the to make the choices that she did yeah. when she made this film, but no, I don't think. Yeah, that's. I, I think one of the hardest parts of bad of people that are critical of the of of the piece is that people who aren't familiar necessarily with the Hasidic world look at this as oh, finally an accurate piece about the Hasidic community, and the reality is that that's not how people who are familiar with the Hasidic community feel about it. Um, so let's go to the next yeah. question, um, and Liad, I'm going to ask you as a Rabbitson if. You know someone who wanted to leave the Orthodox world. Um, if you do, what would your advice be to them? So, first of all, I think it's important to acknowledge why some people leave. Certainly, if we look at unorthodox as an example, whether it's a you know a truth to person 
um, depiction or not, is that uh, many people do have negative experiences, some similar to the one that Esti had, certainly relationships, um, sexuality are, are, big, are big issues, feeling of not being in control of your own life. And, and I think we really, really need to recognize that people have had really, pa have had painful experiences that make them um, want to leave and others who leave for other, for other reasons. But I think what's important, what I would tell anybody was not to throw away the baby with the bathwater. Um, Judaism, contrary to popular belief, is not all or nothing. Most people perceive it as that they're either religious people or not religious people, observant or not observant. And, and Judaism doesn't view itself that way. Um, every single good deed that a person does counts probably more than we can, we can even imagine and has ripple effects um, that, that, that we can see. Um, so I would, I would advise someone to, to really think about the parts of their religious life that they did appreciate and their relationship, their relationship with God is that something that they should keep with themselves always. And wherever they are, a person should always know that God is with them, that God loves them, that God sends them, you know, everything that they need in order to be successful, even if we don't always understand it. And even if we don't see it at first, but to always, to always have that with them um, and to know that the good that's in Torah that they can connect to um, for them is is should be very special. So thank you, Leah. That's um, it, it. Brings me to uh, another interesting question that um, was asked for you, Judge Fryer. Why did people <laughs> why why do people get married so young in the Hasidic world? Um, is it in your experience a desire to fulfill the mitzvah of uh, having a family? Is it to get out of the overbearing arms of their their own family? Um, is it because they aren't pursuing higher education like some uh, Hasidic judges we know? No, I, well, this is the society that I grew up in, and this is what we're accustomed to. Uh, in, in terms of how young is too young, some people will say 18 is perfect. Some will say 19. Some will say, nope, I'm not like my, my kid go out until she's 21. So not everybody gets married at the age of 18. Um, but we we do feel that when we marry off our children that they're ready for marriage. And since it's so important for us to start our own home, that that's really what we, we wait for that day. We wait for that time. But if we feel that one of our children is not ready, then we just don't push them. And, you know, even the question that people have about women being perceived as baby machines and we want to have children. We want to have large families. This is something that really, um, like, like, like Pearl was saying before, to understand the faith, to understand how important these Jewish values are for us is really what helps the people understand why we do what we do. And I think if you just look at the statistics in terms of like in the grand scheme of American society, and what the statistics are in terms of successful marriages. I think the Hasidic couples do a pretty good job. I think we do a pretty good job in having successful marriages. Again, we're not saying everybody because that wouldn't be true of any society. But I think getting married when you're young and when you're more pliable and you're willing to change and grow together is really the best way. Now, my husband will tell you that when we got married, he never thought that I had to go to law school. He never thought along those lines, but we grew together. We grew together and that's how we were able to help each other. It was my goal to help him in his Talmudic studies and I supported him while he was in Kolo. But my personal goal was I wanted to pursue the law, but I was not going to compromise. I, I prayed, God, please help me. Help me succeed in my dream without compromising my values. Because like Pearl said, my community means the world to me. And I'm not going to let go. And I would tell anybody out there, everybody has values. Everybody has their, their values that connect them to God. And whatever your values are, don't think for one second that you have to compromise those values to be successful in the secular world. Because when you show people who you are, they're going to respect you for it. In fact, 
they won't even let you let go if you want to. So that that's my my if I if my message to you all is what you see us do to the outside may seem strange, may seem overbearing, marrying got kids off so young. But these are things that we do because we believe in them. We believe in our mission and our purpose. But that doesn't discount our desires of having stores, becoming designers, becoming professionals, whether it's therapists or nurses or doctors or, or lawyers. One of my judicial interns last year was another Jewish grandmother from Borough Park. And now she practices criminal defense work as a criminal defense attorney. And there are opportunities out there. So whatever your ambitions are, just go for them. So on that really uplifting and inspiring uh, message, I think I'd like to end this in the last five minutes going around the, going around the panel. We have uh, four really impressive women here to really give your parting thoughts either on this conversation, on the film, um, and you know, let's let's start, you know, in, in the order in which you came in, um, whatever your parting words are, and I am fortunately gonna have to hold you to uh, about uh, one minute each. Judge. Oh, okay. So I, I thought I just kind of gave it out already. Okay, but okay. I'll, 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 I'll just say it again. I think that People like myself from the Hasidic community, I, I'd like to say I speak for the silent majority. Most women will not get up to speak. We all have friends in different walks of life and we we appreciate their friendship. I love having friends that have different perspectives. So for for us to to be able to share who we are, especially for me to have this opportunity is, is really wonderful. I'm so glad that I was invited here. And I would even allow people to follow up with questions to my personal email because I think it's so important to those assumptions because most of the time they have wrong assumptions and then take a Netflix series that comes out that just exacerbates these negative assumptions. So my my message to everyone here is that there are many Hasidim who are very happy and very fulfilled and who will be very happy to share with, with the general public the beauty of our lives. Thank you, Pearl. Well, that's a good transition. Um, hopefully I can do that justice um, in the work that, that I do, which I know is complex, but hopefully shows um, the, the many levels. What I hope comes out of this conversation and people who are watching Unorthodox is to, to underline the importance of having these conversations. And if it really upsets you, the way that this film was made, I'm gonna say what I say to my students, I teach at Penn State, you know, make a film or tell your story or write an article. I mean, there are people like Judge Fryer and a woman named Leslie Ginsburg Klein who has started, she's Orthodox, ultra Orthodox, and you know, spoke her truth by starting an organization uh, which educates women among women. And she has her own group of, of women that slam poetry and tell stories within the confines of what they deeply believe. So for me, it's all about, you know, staying true to your voice. Clearly that that is the life I've lived and I encourage others to do the same and safely, obviously, and with respect and dignity. Um, and so my hope is that hearing all these voices, you know, checking in with yourself and how you felt about this very impactful piece on, on Netflix, you know, do something. Uh, make your own work, um, get out there, speak your own truth, start your own business, whatever it is that you, you feel is misrepresented. And, you know, this really is only one mini series. Um, you know, it's, and you know, the, the concept of Dalif Ne Miato made, know before whom you stand, to take it out of the religious context, you know, know your audience. This is what we tell founders all the time. And then they knew their audience. They, we're, we were not the audience, uh, you know, so it, it, you know, just keep that in yeah. mind. So go tell your story and tell it to the audience you would like to reach. Thank it's you. true. It's true. They they did not make uh, unorthodox for Borough Park. Uh, Liz, let's uh, let's hear how you uh, your final oh, thoughts. I think that's a perfect transition. I think they actually made unorthodox for people like me. Um, and I, I see, as I've said on Instagram, the people I follow, my friends, um, they just love the movie. They absolutely love it, and they love recommending it to people. Uh, so I guess I would say to my own community, and I could say this even to myself, um, maybe we should think a little bit before we are so quick to judge the more religious Jews, the ones that if 
you know, Judaism does survive, which hopefully it will, we probably will have them to thank who are keeping our traditions alive. Um, and, um, you know, on a final note, and again, maybe it's very harsh, but I hope that we Jews, especially we more reformed Jews, can hold some of our enemies to the same high, high, high moral standards that we that we hold our own uh, fellow Jews to. So, like I said, but I'm thrilled that we're having this conversation. I mean, and uh, Leah, over to you. So my first message um, from the movie is for mothers-in-law everywhere to take a step back. <laughs> I think it was very clear that a lot of what happened was it came from the meddling, the meddling mother-in-law. Um, I really hope that unorthodox um, causes the religious world to rethink how we treat those that are maybe a little bit different um, in society, what opportunities that we open up for everybody and especially for those that really maybe need something more um, than, the average, than the average normal. Um, and also what we really didn't talk about today is, is um, sexuality and for, for people to be able to, um, to deal with that aspect of themselves um, in, a, in a healthy way. And also I think for, for Jews everywhere, really, for us to, to keep questioning. Um, there's no such thing as a stupid question. Um, certainly here at AISH, we're always open to hear um, anybody's thoughts and um, queries about anything um, in life and to, to pursue your dreams that everybody as an individual has, um, has a unique place um, and, and this world and every person is precious and maybe like the movie, uh, like on the show, the music really that, you know, that each one of us makes a difference. You know, one small violin changed everything um, for the for the conductor, and that's how it is with people. That everyone makes a difference, and together we really, when everybody plays their role properly, we can play the symphony. So, well, thank you, and I want to thank all of you guys. This really has been great. I can see from the feedback from the audience that uh, even though you know, it feels like we're doing this in a in a vacuum, the, the five of us having a conversation and just not aware that there has been a a really overwhelming positive response to this, and the points of view. And, um, you know, I think we, in fairness, um, you know, tackled a lot of information and tried to give a, um, our own personal point of view here. But obviously, there's a lot more nuance here than we had time to cover here. But thank you. Thank you, Aish. Thank you to all four of you. And uh, I am grateful to have hosted this. I, it's really an honor with this incredible esteemed panel. So um, wishing you well and to stay safe. And um, until the next the next time we get this opportunity, hopefully in a more positive uh, um, experience. Um, cheers. Thank you. Thank you.